Yes. So um, together with me, I ask uh, uh, Professor Fernandez to join me in this lecture. And it's a pleasure for me and an honor uh, to be uh, giving this lecture with, with him. Um, he has uh, more than 30 years of uh, engineering experience. Uh, he has been professor. Now he's focusing on consultancy. But he uh, taught me most of what I know about engineering in, gen in general. Um, he started, I think, with a power plant, uh, later uh, working on uh, uh, aeronautics. Uh, uh, an, he's an expert on uh, requirement engineer, engineering, uh, uh, systems engineering. And uh, I think uh, the, uh, the main outcome of a, of a very long uh, and successful career in engineering, both teaching and in practice with companies, is uh, methodology. Uh, for model-based systems engineering, a methodology that is aimed for everyone to apply, no matter whether your system is uh, 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 an entire aircraft or are a small drone. You can use these uh, engineering principles to, to guide your design. And that's model-based uh, systems engineering, the book uh, we published. Uh, with this methodology, we uh, were finalists on a NASA challenge on model-based systems engineering uh, three years ago, I think, already. Um, his methodology is listed by the OMG. I don't know, probably some of you are familiar with uh, the Object Management uh, Group. It's a standard uh, development of organization. So it's listed as one of the uh, main methodologies for model-based systems engineering. Uh, I think all of you know me already a bit, so I'm spare you with my introduction for the sake of time. So we will be discussing this uh, methodology, uh, which is uh, the main characteristics is that it integrates systems and software engineering. And we will be seeing this systems part in the morning, then we will bridge after lunch with the software side of the systems, and it's requirements driven and model based. And it's focusing on the uh, functional architecture, and that will be the focus of the uh, last lecture in the morning. So this is a very long list of point, uh, bullet points that we will be discussing, from systems to software architecting at the end and all the way along the process and the relevance of the functional architecture. We will start with what is a system, and I'm going to give the word to uh, Jose Luis now, to start from the very beginning. So what do we understand for a system and how we characterize systems? Thanks for your words, Carlos, and thanks for your invitation to be here. When we talk about a system, we talk about a thing that is complex, but the whole is more important than the parts. This is, a, 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 this is based on philosophy, Aristoteles. The whole is more important than the parts. Currently, engineers are related with detailed design, with the parts. But we need engineers that see the whole, the interaction of the parts to meet some goal, some mission goal. This is the, the reason of this discipline that is called systems engineering, that unfortunately is not teach in all the universities, but is, is taught in the universities at MIT, John Hopkins, and here in Europe also Cranfield and other universities. So it's an, an important discipline, mainly in the aerospace sector, but also in other sectors of complex products. So we, when we talk about a complex product or system, we are talking a combination of parts function together to meet a need. So very important, the interfaces and to meet needs, to meet requirements. So requirements are a very important issue for us. Unfortunately, this is another topic that some universities don't teach, requirements. How many of you have received some requirements training, requirements engineering training? How many? Bad. 
<laughs> very bad. <laughs> Sorry, but very bad. <laughs> Engineering is based on requirements. Do, do you want to do, do, to, perform, to do engineering or another thing, or algorithms? Algorithms are also based on requirements, okay? So requirements are very, very important, and very good literature about requirements. In the reference, you have. And very good places to read about requirements. If you need to, to know, to read about good requirements, I recommend you to read NASA, okay? For example, in Project Artemis right now, requirements about the astronaut suite. The requirements of the astronaut suite are very interesting to learn, okay? I recommend you learn re reading examples. Also, the NASA handbook of systems engineering is a very good source for reading about systems engineering. ¿Cómo tengo que acercarlo? Ah, con este. ¿A dónde? Aquí. Ah. A lo mejor he dado a dónde no. Bueno, le damos al ratón, ¿eh? Damos al ratón, si no, es igual. Déjalo, damos al ratón. Te digo yo, Nest y ya está. So this is this is a definition given in this handbook that I recommend you. It's free, so you can obtain it from internet. It's free. NASA handbook 2016 is free. It's a it's thick, but it's very very interesting for every engineer to know about how to deal with a complex problem in engineering. Funciona. Currently, there is another concept that is important. That is the concept of systems of systems. For in the military area, it's very important because the missions are more complex, and you have a lot of systems collaboration. Okay. In this case. Is each system has his own goals, but they collaborate in a mission. So in systems of systems engineering, the important thing is to model the mission. Okay? For example, right now, Airbus is developing a methodology for model-based systems engineering, and in the part of the mission, the, what we call the mission the dimension, in the mission dimension, they work with this systems of systems concept, because the, the aircraft in, in, in our days is, in, is a system of systems collaborating with the air traffic control or, and other systems. In the case of military, you have the aircraft, you have UAVs, you have another aircraft that they collaborate for a concrete, a particular mission. So the two other, other important concepts for us is mission. And in, in this robotic area, it's very important you model well the mission of your robot. Before modeling the robot, you have to think about the mission, the purpose of the robot, and the environment where the robot will work. And it's a difficult issue and needs a lot of time before programming or before designing the algorithms, okay? Very important, yeah? Ahora, right. ¿es esto? Sí, ¿no? Concept? The next one is about the sí. function together. Here, the, the, the previous. previous. Here, so for us, the system, I typically standard 1220, the system is not only the product, it's the process to support the product. For example, my maintenance process. Maintenance process is part of the system. Support processes are part of the system. So the system is not only the product. The system is more than the product, okay? <laughs> we have, and the product is split into subsystems. And the subsystems 
are split into assemblies, and the assemblies are split into components. Components may be hardware components or software components. Okay? Next slide. For understanding a methodology, we need an ontology. Here is the ontology I developed for this methodology. An ontology is a map of the concepts we use in, the onto in, the, in, in our model-based systems engineering method. We use some concepts and some relation between these concepts. Here, in the, in the left side, we have the concept of the system. The system has parts, and the parts may, can be composite part. A subsystem is a composite part because a composite part is composed of simple parts. Okay? This is the part of the system. And between the parts, you have physical interfaces. But it's not only the important thing. The important thing is that the system operates in an environment. You have to define in all the universe where, do you, where your system is applying. It's not applying in all the universe. It's applying in a part of the universe. This part of the universe is what we call the environment. It's very, very important. Because you need to know interactions with the environment, but not intended interactions, also unintended interactions. For example, ele electromagnetic interference. So for as engineers, we need to model the environment and to model the context in this environment, how we operate in this environment, the operational context. This operational context is specified by scenarios. Scenarios are very similar to what we call um, scripts in movies, storyboards in movies. Very similar. Okay, it's the same concept. The, the, the storyboard in a movie, that in some cases is some movie directors prefer very good storyboards before filming the movie. From the scenarios, we obtain needs that are no requirements, are role requirements, needs what the actor needs from the system in this scenario. For example, I, I, develop, I participate in a European project developing a medical device. In the, the needs are the needs of the surgeon in the scenario from the device. The need are, the subject of the need is the surgeon. The subject of a requirement is the system. Very important. The subject of a need is the actor. The subject of a requirement is the system. Okay? So we have needs, and we, from the needs, we identify system capabilities. For example, if we have the need of a mission, of long time mission, we need, a ca we infer from this need, a capability that is very typical in pneumatic vehicles, long endurance. Long endurance is a capability of many UAVs. This capability is complex because this capability influences in properties of the system, in the case of an aircraft, the wind span, and quality attributes, reliability. You need reliability to have long endurance. And in functional requirements, you need health monitoring functions. So a capability is an aggregation of properties. Properties that might be quality attributes, reliability, usability, safety, states of the system, different states, physical properties, mass, color, whatever, and functions, health monitoring. For example, in spacecraft, in aircraft, currently it's very important all the health monitoring functions. It's a big topic of research in industry and in universities. In the case of, in the, in, there is a university in Australia working in health monitoring for aircraft. When we have these properties, we have to specify 
requirements to meet these properties. Is it easy? No, it is not easy, but you have to do it. We need engineers working in these areas, in industry. For example, the other day, an, a company that you know is Dyson. You know Dyson? Vacuum cleaners, hair dryers, very expensive. They are requesting systems engineers. You have requirements. Requirements are allocated to parts. And you, with allocating requirements, design the physical parts. So the requirements are the foundation for designing the physical parts. If you don't have requirements, how do you design? From scratch? I don't understand. And rework, rework, and rework. If you design from scratch, rework, rework, and rework. The problem is that non-functional requirements are not allocated, are implemented. There is a difference in the words. Functional requirements allocated, non-functional requirements implemented, and we use heuristics, what you'd call tactics. Heuristics or tactics are the way to implement safety requirements, reliability requirements in some cases, maintainability requirements, etc. You follow me? Why are they not allocated? Because functional requirements are soft, soft goals. And functional requirements are not allocated because if you have a safety requirement, you need to redesign part of your system with patterns to apply this requirement. In the other case, you allocate the functionality to one part. But non-functional requirements are the same issues. You, you have to change the design. To a single part. Correct. Ah, okay. Good. They go to patterns. So heuristics are implemented using architectural patterns. In some cases, huh? For example, in the case of safety, yes. I work in this area. I have some safety in the medical device. I have some safety issues, some safety requirements, and I implement it with an architectural pattern, for example, that is called sanity check. The, the, the main problem is this one. This is very important. Not all the model-based systems engineering methodologies deal with, this, with that. No. This is the same. So, we, uh, so the text before was just the explanation over the conceptual model. So you can uh, have that in, in the slides. Um, Let's get uh, active now. Um, so we have uh, the lightweight autonomous underwater vehicle uh, developed by one of the uh, Rimaro partners, University of Porto, and marketed by OMST, both partners in the, in the project. So this is a practical case, and let's start thinking of systems. So if we compare an autonomous robot, an autonomous underwater robot with humans, uh, there is some parts of us that perform specific roles, that they have functional roles, right? So we have the body, our body, vital organs, ears, eye, brain, nervous system. Uh, we have the food also that we need uh, to live. We have muscles and joints. So what do they correspond to? And uh, we start with the body. What's the body in the case of an underwater robot? <laughs> I'm going to give some hints. So sometimes you can refer to it as a well, platform is a <laughs> quite vague uh, now nowadays. Um, but you can think of uh, the body of the, as the physical platform, which uh, someone from um, maritime uh, expertise can tell me what's the body of an underwater or a submarine. No? No one, really? The hull, yes, thank you. Lobster team. <laughs> I was expecting you to know. Um, I'm not sure what it is. It's going to show at the time? Yeah. No. <laughs> um, so the hull, vital organs. And uh, we can think of those as the uh, subsystems, maybe. Sorry for the typo, probably that should say subsystems here. So uh, we may have electronics, uh, 
what else in an underwater vehicle? What subsystems do you guys have at Lobster? Okay, those could be ears and eyes. Which sensors do you use in an underwater robot? Uh, Doppler plus pillow. Uh, Dop uh, Doppler plus pillow. Uh, things like sonar. Uh, do you have more like uh, USBL for communication, but also localization? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm you, of course. Uh, a pressure sensor, a GPS, indeed. Yeah, thanks for that. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Joris, right? Yes. So, Joris from a company on underwater robots, uh, as already mentioned, quite some. Uh, I'm not sure whether we already mentioned the uh, pipeline following case that we are developing in Remaro. So, in that case, we also have cameras. Um, we will discuss uh, about uh, how useful are cameras in uh, the North Sea. Uh, we have brain, the nervous system. Can someone shout what that is in the case of an <coughs> autonomous robot? Computer is the brain, right? And the software is the mind? That's a classic. Um, so food, what's the food for an underwater robot? How is your lobster propelled? Uh, batteries. batteries. In some cases, we may have, uh, I don't know, diesel engines in, uh, in a bigger submarine. Probably not. In, we have maybe even nuclear. Um, effectors. Propellers. Thrusters. Anything else? Joints. How do you call the fins? Do you call them fins? Um, we don't really have yes. Oh, yeah, that's true. You have a very fancy design with four propellers. So something like this, right? So uh, we may have uh, the hull is the body. Then we have power navigation as example of uh, subsystems of vital organs for our AUV. Uh, we have sonar, camera, IMU, uh, uh, digital processing. That's a very vague term. I think you came up with better words like computer, etc. cetera. Uh, batteries for the food, propellers, motors, etc. So this is an example of a system. And you can see that we can have similar roles independently of which system we are talking about, right? So that already points to functionality, something that transcends the particularities of one implementation, things that are more general and therefore more reusable across the science. So now we are going to be discussing a bit, and we need to speed up a bit, uh, <laughs> how the process of systems engineering uh, goes. And I'm going to give the word back to uh, Jose Luis. Uh, we will be discussing about why we need systems engineering and what's the scope of systems engineering. Thank you very much, Carl. Next slide. Samia is a person working in IBM, and they are very interested in what they call smart products. What we think about a smart product, we have multiple technical fields. Mechatronics, for example. Electronics, mechanical, software. Software is critical. These days, software is critical in, mo in the majority of the systems. The, the, the example of the cars is very, very important. To, currently, in, in some cases, a car has has more software than, a, than an aircraft, typically. Okay, more than um, in the case of the F-35, perhaps no, but the other aircraft, a car has more software than, than an aircraft. Software is integrated with hardware. The system interacts with other systems, systems of systems. Regulatory issues are very important. In all the products that safety is important, regulatory is very important. And it's a big problem in autonomous vehicles, currently, in autonomous cars. And the project is complex. The project is complex because the, the product is complex, and you should contract some of the things to other 
companies. And if you should contract, you need good requirements to force your contracting. And you, you need good integration. And it's not an easy. In the aircraft industry, it's a big problem, that. So we have, do we need a discipline that integrates diverse silos? Because engineers' tendency is to work in silos. I am in the mechanical silo. I am in the electrical or electronic silo. It's my problem. I am in the software silo. It's my problem. No, because there are constraints between the silos. And we need to inform of these constraints between the silos. And we, we need to work together. We need a discipline that coordinates and integrates. And this discipline is what we call systems engineering. That is not very old discipline. It's from the 30 years of the last century, before the World War II. Okay? I will explain this later, these constraints with an example of robotics. Next slide. So if we work in silos, we have different solutions depending of my interest. If I am the aerodynamic engineer or I am the stress engineer or the electrical engineer, the airplane is different. No, we need only one airplane. So we need to integrate silos. We need to integrate disciplines. We have another fun activity. Uh, so you can uh, use your phones, uh, get here. Uh, I don't know if some of you know uh, Menti, Mentimeter. And you can uh, help us decide what are the disciplines involved in an AUV. So you can just type, and we, we will generate a, a word cloud. So think, what are the disciplines? So inspection. OK, that depends. Uh, uh, so it's a concrete application case for an AUB. Navigation. Those are kind of functions in the system rather than disciplines of the engineers. You have to think of the engineers that are going to be working. Are there navigation engineers? Uh, maybe in robotics nowadays, they, they are. We are out of ideas. You can, it's not refreshing? Let's try to refresh this. <coughs> refresh. Oh, yeah, thank you. Software development, mechatronics, control, hardware development, functional testing. Fluid mechanics, hydraulic, navigation inspection, signal processing, archaeology. Nice. <laughs> Someone has a very interesting application in, in mind. The mission. <laughs> Artificial intelligence. Wow, that's really small. Electronic, electronics. Yeah, we need some AI to group better the similar words. So. This is just to give you an idea of the amount of, uh, of disciplines that are involved in developing an autonomous <coughs> system and concretely an, an AUV. We are going to speed up a bit because we are 15 minutes behind the schedule and uh -huh. probably you want coffee. Um, so we have seen this and now we continue. This is important here, only one, only one example. What we mean about constraints is very important. I remember. Um, I have a very smart student when I was professor, a smart um, genius. He, it was a, he was a genius, very, very intelligent person. And he, develop, he developed 
a robot with joints, elastic joints. Okay? A robot with elastic joints. To develop this robot, really, he developed three projects. Mechanical design, electrical design, and so on. Okay? Three final degree works. It's important that we, you have here the functional model, and the main model, is, is the part that is shared by all the disciplines. But they ha you have constraints because the mechanical constraints that are in the, the joints, the elastic, elastic joints, constrain the microcontrollers that you need here. And the microcontrollers you need here constrain the software. So it's very important to identify the constraint issues. And you need to work together to work with this constraint and to work with the functional model. The functional model, the functionality, is shared by all, all the engineers. Because you develop a product to meet the functionality. It's very important this. Okay? The core of the model is the functionality. Ah, there are two, pon las dos, Carlos, pon las two, NASA handbook has different um, definitions of systems engineering. These two are complementary. The first is a discipline to integrate multiple disciplines in a life cycle. This is the first definition. Okay? And the second definition is what is written here? Requirement, fulfillment. So you engineer a product to meet requirements. NASA award, okay? Important. So if, if I don't have requirements, you have a problem. So it's very important is have good requirements because you need to meet requirements. And we call this activity in systems engineering validation. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. Validation is check if you do the right thing. And the right thing is the thing that meet requirements. In systems engineering, we use what we call the B model. The B model is the left side of the B is the product definition. And the right side of the B is the product integration and the product verification and validation. Verification is, validation is do the right thing. Verification is do the thing right. <laughs> okay? Validation, do the right thing, meet requirements. Do the thing right is meet the process of engineering. Hmm? In very important in industry. I don't know in universities, but in industry is very important. Do the thing right, do the right thing. Okay? Nice. I think we are, uh, we are done with the. So we are done with this block. Um, we have uh, 10, 15 minutes of uh, model base. Do, we, do you prefer to do the break now, or we just go through this and do the break in uh, 15 minutes? We continue. Let's uh, speed up uh, with this part. <clears throat> so we have seen uh, systems engineering. Now we are going to be seeing a modern version of it, which is model-based systems engineering, with a special focus on the processes, the methods, and not so much on the tools. Um, today. <clears throat> so uh, what characterizes uh, model-based systems engineering as opposed to traditional systems engineering is the use of an integrated system model through the process rather than documents. Uh, that facilitates uh, a lot uh, uh, the verification uh, and validation that Jose Luis was mentioned, because now you don't need to check 
uh, hundreds of documents that need to be updated with every design change, but everything are views of a centralized model that allows for automating stuff and uh, facilitating the entire process in a complex, uh, in a complex system. So the whole uh, V model of, uh, of development uh, is supported by that central model. And there are three pillars about uh, on uh, model base, as mentioned by Deligati, uh, famous author, uh, if, uh, if you know a bit about model base. Um, he has a, a great book on it, very practical. He mentions uh, the methodology, the modeling language, as the, and the tool as the three elements that an engineer practicing model base have to master to, to be able to develop the <laughs> systems following this, uh, this paradigm. Uh, I'm just going to point to one example of the benefits. Actually, model base uh, is still in development. So this is not uh, well a well-established method that everyone is using. Some people, like NASA, Airbus in some cases, are using that for their advanced systems. But it's not that widely spread. So there is still discussion about the value of applying it. So uh, recently, Janse from uh, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory mm -hmm. uh, from NASA uh, made a study on a real system that they are developing to bring samples from Mars. And that's the capture, uh, capture containment, and return module. That's the whole thing that you can see here. <coughs> um, so their paper is focused only on the capture and orient module, which is this part here. There you can see how big this is uh, with respect to one person. It's not that impressive, but think that this is going to Mars and bringing something. So it's actually quite impressive. <laughs> uh, and they analyze the whole engineering process uh, of this uh, subsystem uh, and how uh, using model base compared to using traditional uh, document-based approach. And actually, they discovered that the information transfer from one step in the engineering process to the other, so uh, system architects producing the architecture, someone picking it up, and now uh, developing with those requirements a concrete system, for example. Those are information transfers in the whole uh, V model cycle. Uh, so the improvements could have been only 13%, basically. Uh, but that's based on what they were applying of model base. So that was not the full model base approach. If every information transfer could be automated with uh, the tools for model base, they found that probably, and there is a gigantic matrix in, in that paper that you can check, uh, it could have uh, automated 81% of the development. So you can imagine the impact of this for verification, validation, quality, and costs in the process. So instead of people having hundreds of meetings, discussions, thousands of emails with varying requirements, you can automate all that and check whether things go, uh, went wrong where automatically. Concrete case is a very interesting uh, paper. If you like uh, space development also, it's very fun to read. Um, so what, uh, what, is, uh, what is a model in model-based systems engineering? And those, these are very different models of the si for a system of what uh, Ertal were, uh, was discussing yesterday. Uh, so this is not the uh, dynamic equations of the system, uh, but it's a different type of abstraction. It's also an abstraction. Um, that is the, uh, it's an abstraction of a system uh, of interest that is developed for a purpose. And this is very important. We are not modeling everything or anything. We are modeling a specific uh, aspects of the system that are of our interest for its development. Uh, it, and this uh, concretely translates into, uh, it needs to, trans, uh, to address a specific needs of the customer. So we are not just modeling for the sake of modeling, but to be able to communicate about certain, certain things, about, uh, so as to be able to validate certain things. So it's not for the sake of modeling. And that's something that when someone is, starts with model-driven approaches and start modeling everything, can get lost on, I, I just keep modeling. But what for, basically? So it has to have a clear usefulness to engineer the system. Otherwise, you are modeling for nothing, basically. It can be a hobby, enjoy it, but it's not part of engineering. So typically, the, the purposes of the model are two. Uh, on the left side of the me model, typically it's about communicating between the different experts through uh, the process. And on the right side, 
when you start verifying and eventually validating your requirements, is about validation. You use the model to check that things went as you expected it to go. Um, CSML is the uh, standard uh, language for model-based systems engineering. How many of you have heard of CSML? Raise hands. Okay, quite some people. And UML? Almost everyone, right? Okay, so I'm not going to waste uh, too much time. You know the kind of diagrams, etc., that we use. So uh, CSML evolved from UML. It was a partnership of the OMG and uh, INCOSE. And um, it's a superset of a subset of UML2. So if you have UML, you have a subset, and it incorporates other things. Simple Venn diagram. I hope everyone is following. So uh, there are uh, many CSML diagrams that capture behavior requirements. This is a difference from UML. Uh, and the structure of the system. Uh, those in blue are the ones we will be uh, focusing. Uh, actually, we are going to just dis uh, discuss the activity diagram because it's really interesting for uh, the flow, uh, the functional flows in the system. And probably you are already familiar with class diagrams, component diagrams, and those correspond to the block definition diagram and internal block definition diagrams in CSML. We just rep they represent parts of the system, an aggregation of parts of the system. So we are not going to focus on those too much, and we will be using activity diagrams today. <clears throat> Why those are very uh, the activity diagrams are so interesting for our methodology is because they express the sequence of behaviors and events that happen to the system. So they relate directly to the storyboards, to the scenarios that uh, Jose Luis was mentioning, that they specify initially what do you want the system to do? What is the expected behavior of the system? So we use uh, intensive use of those activity diagrams uh, in detriment uh, of sequence diagrams that probably some of you, if you have done uh, UML, maybe you have done sequence diagrams. So what a couple of uh, components or classes it changed, basically. Uh, but that's kind of more implementation level from compared to what we are discussing today. We are discussing uh, functions and logical sequence of, general, of behavior of the system. And for that, an activity diagram is uh, more suited. Uh, activity I will go now into activity diagrams, actually. So uh, we will be using only a subset of what you can describe with an activity diagram. Uh, so the language, CSML, allows you to express many things. We are be focusing on expressing the functional flow in the system. So we will not be making use of all possible symbols or uh, semantics of, uh, of activity diagrams, but only a subset. So to uh, explain it a bit, uh, I'm going to make use of an example. So we have this uh, robotic system. I'm using a, an example from the projects I kind of became, I think maybe, I, I got some expertise. I will not call myself an expert. There are better experts here that develop these uh, systems. Uh, so this is a collaborative robot. It has a robot skin that basically, apart from uh, becoming red when there is contact uh, or close contact, uh, it stops and only resumes when the, when the contact is gone and it's gathering an or picking an order from these uh, four different products into, uh, into a tote or a bin uh, there. So it's a very simple system, just doing pick and, please, uh, pick and place, uh, structure sequence of events. Uh, so I'm going to show you a potential description of this functionality in an activity diagram. So uh, can anyone uh, tell me where things are start happening in this diagram. There are many, many symbols, boxes. Do we start here? Do we start here? Sorry? Black dot. Black dot. Good. We have two. Both start at the same time. Actually, in, uh, I did it this way some time ago. Probably now I could not do it that way. I would just split this into activity diagrams. We have one flow here and another flow on the top. Basically, the reason is this one is running continuously. Uh, is the detecting obstacle thing. So it's a separate function that is running continuously. And this represents the main flow of the system. 
Uh, so in an activity diagram, we have actions, right, that execute with transitions. And the difference, uh, well, uh, specifically in our methodology, we are representing control flow. So can anyone tell me actually what abstraction this is? Some of you are from formal model. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, what is this? Is this a state machine? It's not a state machine. Thank you. It's a, this is a Petrinet. Who knows Petrinet? Petrinet? Good. Okay, some people. Okay. So, this is a Petrinet. Okay, they just added some semantics and some fancy uh, symbols for, uh, with the specific semantics for systems. Well, I'm just going to go through, through them. I had it. Well, so Petrinet, so when, when, when this diagram is activated, a token starts flowing from the start nodes to the next one unless there is some guard condition preventing it from flowing. So we have a token starting here and a token starting there. So that, let's follow that, uh, that one. So the first thing is order request. And this is a special symbol for uh, event acceptance. So basically, this is executing order request till someone requests the order and then it's processed. And then the control token continues continues to the next one to obtain the stack of indexes. So basically the robot is receiving an order and uh, deciding, okay, so I need to pick this product, this product, etc. So I'm retrieving the indexes from the database so I know where to pick them from. And now I get the first one, the first index, and I check, this is a, um, a decision node. So I check whether, is this the last product I have to pick? Because if it's the, the last one, I just finish. Uh, but this is not the last one. So the, uh, the last index is actually zero for a string, so it will finish. Uh, it's a guard condition not to keep uh, moving infinitely. Uh, so if not, then we start doing things. So we'll obtain collision-free trajectories, then wait for confirmation that there are no obstacles on our way, and then we have a fork uh, uh, node. So our control token that came this way now splits in two control tokens. Uh, one that is commanding and monitoring the trajectory execution, so the robot is moving. So most of what you saw in the video is actually this bit, basically. The robot is moving. Actually, no. You saw these two. So there is a, a subsystem moving the robot. That's the robot controller. And you have our uh, our control computer running rows commanding the trajectory that is being executed by the uh, controller box in the robot. Those two actually happen in parallel and you have actually two computers running parallel processes. So when this finish, we need to wait that both are finished to continue our operation. Uh, we split the motions of the robot in different parts of the trajectory, so just moving over the product and then we pick the product. So what happens is that later we obtain a specific type of trajectory that allows us to grasp the product. And before grasping, we need to open the gripper. We generate suction, actually, to be able to pick it because it was with a suction cap. And conversely, now we have all, also the split control of the motions and the motions of the robot. And those are two different functions in the system that actually are executed in parallel. So this is overall how this works. I will not enter into the second one for the sake of time, but you can uh, check it. So I've already explained some of these nodes. Uh, actually, no. We, uh, we explained the get uh, accept event, but the, to accept a, an event, someone needs to be uh, creating that event. So there is the send signal node that in this case, what, uh, how this is modeled is we have the main flow of execution running but if there is an obstacle, the robot needs to stop. So the flow, the functional flow responsible for detecting uh, obst obstacle is executing periodically, okay? And sending this signal. And this signal is actually interrupting. And this is an interruption, an uh, interruptible uh, 
region, interrupting this, and changing the flow from here to a special case when the signal is received, which is, okay, we cancel our trajectory and we opt try to find a new trajectory, okay? So this is just to explain some of the symbols here. I hope uh, you can uh, follow a bit. Uh, and in the, in the next hour, we are going to be discussing how we come up with these uh, actions or activities that start with an F. So it gives you the hint that we are talking about functions, actually, that are executed in the system. And those functions are coming from everyone, re re requirements. <laughs> uh, there was more stuff here. I already mentioned the decision notes, star notes. Oh, two final, uh, final activity notes. So when we reach this one, everything finish. When we reach this one, only these tokens finish. But this might still continue. Okay, yes. Some notation. And we can nest, so we can decompose activities and actions. So this action is actually invoking an entire behavior. So you can just replace this for starting here, finishing here. There is a bit of more complexity in this semantics, but I will spare you those. Um, and finally, this type of diagrams can also be extended with allocation. So you can, we can allocate, as Jose Luis was mentioning before, so we allocate functional requirements, right? And here we have functions, so they are kind of requirements in a sense. So we allocate them to parts of the system, to components in the system. So control means basically our ROS graph, all, all that we have programmed. So all these, we, uh, all those functions are being performed by our ROS software for the system. As I mentioned, I, could, I just simplified to robot. This is the robot controller box executing that bit, that bit. And then we have the detect obstacles that is allocated to the robot skin subsystem. Um, so we are going to be focusing on the next hour on methodology, basically. So how we have developed this kind of, system, of uh, model. What, how we came up with, uh, with this functional flow. Uh, so Stefan defines uh, an, M an MVC uh, methodology as a collection of processes, methods, and tools. And we will see in the next hour the pro processes and methods of the ISE uh, PPOA methodology, uh, meaning process, what, uh, what needs to be done, so what are the steps, that we need to do, and the methods are how we perform those steps. What are the tricks? What are the, uh, uh, the instructions to perform those steps? We are not that interested in tools today. There are many tools to support this. If you are familiar with UML and uh, Eclipse and uh, uh, all this kind of uh, stuff, you know what I'm talking about. And we have a complex diagram here, but this is just representing our methodology the model of which we are interested in views, those are uh, uh, the diagrams, because we want to see, to communicate the specific parts of the model for each uh, interested stakeholder or engineer, so we capture those in views. And uh, we have the modeling language, in our case we use CSML activity diagrams, but we also use traditional systems engineering diagrams, uh, the N squared chart, also textual descriptions are necessary to convey what a function is supposed to do, for example. Um, Jose Luis already explained the ontology of ISC PPA, like how we conceptualize a system, so what the parts, etc. And uh, all these can be supported by tools. Again, if you are familiar with UML, UML or CSML profile, we have already, a colleague has created together with Jose Luis, a profile for ISC PPA that you can apply with uh, Cameo. The, it used to be called Magic Draw, uh, one. Uh, model-based systems engineering tool that is used uh, quite intensively by industry, basically. So, we finish. We are way behind the schedule. You deserve a coffee. Uh, 15 minutes coffee, and now we go step by step how we 
build these models and these diagrams, departing from... Only, only two points. You, can, you, you mentioned state diagrams. You can combine in the same model state diagrams and activity diagrams. Why, for example, if your system have modes of operation, you combine you, the modes of operation are modeled as the states. And you combine the states with the functionality that is performed in each state. The tool allows you to do that, okay? For example, an automatic pilot in an aircraft have 80, more or less, 80 states. So you can combine states and functionality. The activity that other thing is very important. Good tools, you can simulate activity diagrams. So in the simulation of the activity diagrams, it doesn't work, you have a problem. But it does work, you have a problem as well. Because the simulation is not a guarantee that the behavior is well modeled. But if the simulation fails, you know that the model is not OK. OK? It's very important. And the tools right now are very good simulation, simulating activity diagrams. OK? Very good. We, we use uh, that. OK? No. So we're moving to the coffee break, and then we'll go through the steps of the methodology, building this diagram from the requirements to the functionality. Wow. Wow.